guys? Welcome to another episode of Sport Vitamins. Today we go back to the United States and uh, we have uh, the Director of Operations at Nebraska University, Luca Virgilio. Welcome to the show, Luca. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Me and Luca worked together many years ago. We haven't seen each other in seven years. We were talking yeah, about this a <laughs> long time ago. And uh, Luca, in this podcast, we try to understand the path of many uh, sport professionals. We had athletes, head coaches, strength coaches, uh, some motivators from different sports and different backgrounds. So I would like to start with, uh, with your background. Okay, well, like you said, we, we worked together a long time ago uh, in a great place called Stella Azzurra in Rome, Italy. And um, I started working for, uh, for the Stella Azzurra Academy as a, as a basketball coach. I mean, I just, I love basketball. I wanted to get into the sport business somehow. And that was the, the first step that I uh, did in this, uh, in this industry. And uh, starting with that, I was a basketball coach and I always loved uh, scouting. So I was traveling at the same time and just going into these different events all over Europe and just, you know, trying to learn how to move around in the business, you know, starting my network of people and just you know, try to figure it out. I mean, as you know, in Europe, it's not easy because there is not a lot of resources, not a lot of money. So you gotta need to figure it out to start with. Um, at the same time I was studying and that helped me a lot to make the next step in my, in my career. I got a bachelor degree in business administration and then I got a master of science in, in sports, uh, in uh, business administration as well. Um, seven years ago, I got a chance to, uh, meet at Stella Azzurra, um, during the summer, you know, all those, um, summer trips that college do usually. Um, and I had a chance to meet with a couple of them and we just started talking about potentially going into the United States. And my, my biggest goal at the beginning was to, you know, study in the United States. I didn't even think about move to the United States and start working right away. I wanted to do a master in, uh, in sports management. That was my, my biggest goal. And I, I was really lucky and I got an offer to move to New York and uh, be a graduate assistant for St. John's University and for uh, Coach Steve Lab. Um, I accepted the offer right away. Didn't have to think about it too much. Uh, and that's how I started. So I started in Rome and then I moved, and then I moved to New York. That's, that's how I started my career in, uh, in college basketball in the United States. Well, where are your main duties at St. John's? So when, when you are a graduate assistant, basically it's kind of a mix between as a position where you are learning how to do almost everything. You're allowed to be on the court and work the players out. And at the same time, you're trying to learn how to do the operation side of the business. You're learning how to prep for games. So you're trying to you know, help everybody on staff. You're helping the assistant coaches. You're helping the head coach. You're helping the director of basketball operations. You're helping the players with whatever they need. So you just, it's the perfect position to start in, in college basketball, especially for someone like me who was coming from overseas and didn't have a clear picture of what college basketball or just overall the American business sport was. And it was great. Um, I was there for two years as a graduate assistant. I started for uh, Coach Steve Lavin, but then after a year, he decided to step down. And so I didn't really know what was about to happen because I was eight months into my first job experience. And I was lucky enough again. And then when coach Chris Mullin was hired, he decided to keep me on staff for, for my second year. And as a graduate assistant, you're also going to school. So I was also pursuing my master in sports management. So it's just, you know, it's a 24-7, 365 days position where you never stop and you try to learn as much as you can. And I was incredibly lucky because I learned from Steve Lavin first and then from Chris Mullen. And I stayed at St. John's with Chris Mullen for a total of uh, four years. So I, I spent five years in New York. I mean, there is worse places to start your, uh, your career at, that's for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And also being together with... Uh... There's great, uh, great coaches and, uh, and I guess amazing people. And uh, right now you're working with Fred Olbert. So basically you're, you always work with legends. How it is? 
Yeah, I've been blessed to be honest. Uh, I so after after my uh, I spent five years at St. John's total. Uh, Chris Mullin decided to step down now almost eighteen months ago, um, and I got a call to uh, to move to Nebraska, and I got an offer to be the director of basketball operations for University of Nebraska. Um, I never thought in my life I would move to Nebraska. I've been to Nebraska a couple of times because when when I was at St. John's. Uh, we play in the Big East, and Creighton is a university that is part of the Big East, and they're located in Omaha, that is the main city in Nebraska, and it's about an hour away from Lincoln, and Lincoln is where University of Nebraska is. Um, it's about 300,000 people, and the main reason why there is a city here is because the University of Nebraska is, and it's a university that lives for football. They have uh, an amazing stadium with 90,000 people that has been sold out forever. Uh, if you want to go to the game and you don't have a ticket, you're not going to find a ticket. It's been like this for the last, I don't know, 80 years. It's the entire state of Nebraska lives for Nebraska football and Nebraska basketball. We have an arena that is brand new. It's five years old. It's 12,000 people. It can get up to 14,000 too. It's always been sold out. And we were not really good this year. We just won seven games. But sold out every game. Even when we lost 15 games in a row, not an empty seat in the stands. And funny thing is that they love volleyball too and they have an arena of 9,000 people sold out every game. And volleyball is, it's amazing. They have an amazing team. The head coach for volleyball has been final four, I think three times in the last five years. And I had no idea that volleyball was big in, in Nebraska. And that's another thing that I find out. Uh, that's amazing. And uh, Omaha is also famous for baseball. You didn't mention yeah, that, but I know. it's super they, famous for baseball. World series. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So how, how different is your position right now in Nebraska compared to what you were doing in St. John's? So my last three years at St. John's, I was a uh, special assistant to the head coach first. And then my last two years, I was management analyst. My last two years, I mainly focused on analytics. So I was basically running all the numbers and the data to provide as much information as possible to the coaching staff when it comes to, you know, player rotation or even in college basketball, you need to basically decide your opponents for the first 12 games of the season. So you pick your opponents based on analytics. And I was the one that was putting together all the numbers to say, okay, let's play opponent B instead of opponent A. Now that I'm in Nebraska and I'm the director of basketball operations, my main responsibility is the team budget. I'm basically the CFO of the, of the program. So when, when we need to spend money, everything has to go through me and I'm the connection between senior administration, so the athletic director and the university CFO and our basketball program. So that's my main duty. And then, you know, I have all the other smaller duties that are my responsibilities, and that's the day-to-day -day operations. Everything that, happens, that, ha that happens off the court goes through me. Everything that goes on the court is Coach Hoiberg. Everything that's off the court, it's me. And then we have one assistant coach that uh, is main responsibility is recruiting. So, you know, these are the three main, um, to make it as simple as possible, these are the three main um, characters in the in the picture right now so basically you don't work on the court anymore right no no as basically in college basketball there are four people that are allowed on the court the head coach and three assistant coaches those four are the ones that work the players out every time uh it's just an ncaa rule where you're not allowed to to be on the court so if i want to work a, a kid out i cannot do that uh, assistant coaches are the ones that are doing that they're very strict on those type of rules here in, uh, in, uh, in college basketball. Got it. So what does one uh, of your typical days look like? Well, you know, right now that we are about five weeks away from the beginning of the season, we like to work out in the morning. Uh, so I usually get into the office around 7 a.m. We do about an hour prep for practice. And then the guys start in the weight room at about 8. They go for 45 to 50 minutes in the weight room. And, and then they get on the court. And that's usually they, – they usually lift right now the three times a week. 
when we were during the summer, they were lifting probably four or five times a week. Now it's just three times a week. And after that, we get on the court. So we practice from about 9 a.m. to 10.45. And after that, they shower and we have study hall. That's the favorite part of the day for our guys. So basically, we have our uh, academic tutors. They come in into our uh, facility and they sit down with our guys for about an hour, an hour and a half. After that, we have food that is being catered in. They eat and then they go to class. And usually class, it depends on how many classes they have. And it's also different now with COVID because almost all the classes are online. So they don't actually need to go to class in person, but they can just sit down and, and be on Zoom. Uh, but if they were going to class, usually it's from 1 to about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. And then after that, I'm, I'm done for my day. So I can just, you know, stay in the office and work on different projects. There is always something going on. Uh, but for our guys, after they're done with class, they come back and they just do some shooting sessions. They work with uh, Coach Hoiberg or one of the assistant coaches on something on the court. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, now that we're getting closer to the season, probably our practices are going to be longer. And, and then we get into game time, finally. And November 25th for us is getting closer. It is. One thing that always fascinates me about college basketball is how you guys um, manage to hold your players accountable with all the, the things that are going on on the court and hold them accountable outside the court. How do you manage that? Well, that's definitely one of the most important things. When you're building a program from scratch, and that's what we have to do here, basically when, when Coach Weber got the job, we just had two players returning. And so you, usually when you have an I major program like we have, you have 13 scholarship players plus three or four walk-ons. And walk-ons are usually the players that are not on scholarship. So they pay uh the tuition for the school and they just are part of your team usually are just practice players to make it easier um the, the main goal when you starting from scratch is to build the foundation of the program and to do that you need to start with high character guys to build you know culture and that's that's the most important thing when you're starting from scratch that's why our main focus was about building the foundation and last year we struggled on the court a lot because we were trying to send the right message on how to behave on and off the court. That was our main priority. We knew that going into the year would have been a tough year and probably on the court is going to be hard to win a lot of games, but we want to make sure we build a strong foundation of the program. So going forward, when we increase the level of talent of our guys, we have a strong foundation to rely on. And that's where we feel confident that last year we won seven games. But we knew that that was about to happen going into the, the, the year one. But now we, our expectation is to increase that number of wins, of course. And we also have guys that have been with us for a year and they know how to be a on and off the court. And that's extremely important when you're dealing with kids that, like you said, they're 19 to 22, 23 years old. And they're coming from very complicated environments, family environments that are completely different from the one that we're used to in Europe. It's completely different. I mean, it's, it's hard to explain how different it is. And it, you need to build a relationship with them. And one thing that I learned is the most important thing in, in college sport, and it's college basketball, college football, college baseball, doesn't matter, is the relationship that you build with the players. Because that's what's going to make a difference uh, in, in the long run. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's very important. And what's the first thing that you teach them when, uh, when it comes to mentality? Well, one thing that we're trying to, to teach them right away is to be honest and transparent and to listen. You know, for most of these kids, they're coming from high school or AU programs where they've been a start, they've been the social media icon, they've been all of that. And when you get to college, it's completely different. So you need to, you know, shift your mentality as quick as you can, because if you get stuck into that, it's going to be hard for you to, to actually make it at this level. So we want them to be transparent with us and communicate always. And then on the court, I mean, you need to work. You need to work as much as you can. If you want to be successful, you got to have to spend time on the court. 
It's not about Instagram. It's not about your highlight tape from high school. If you're not on the court, you're never going to make it. And you need to spend time on the court on and off every day. It doesn't matter if it's an off day. You come in, you get your work. I mean, it, it's up. It's on you. I mean, we can help you and we can get you to a certain point. But then if you want to make it, you got to have to bring it every day. Yeah, true. And um, it's the same when you work with pro players. Uh, I try to have the same kind of mentality. And that's the same thing that I, I always tell to my players. I had this kind of conversation with one of my players today, telling him, man, I'm here for you 24-7, but uh, it's you that you have to, to do the job, you know. At the end of the day, you need to show up and give 100% of what you have every single day. You don't want to be here. We're just, I'm wasting my time and you're wasting your time. So you better figure it out. Otherwise, it's just everybody's wasting time. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's switch gears. And uh, doing my research for this podcast, I watched your website and I saw your athletic performance lab. That's something crazy. Okay, unbelievable. Can you please tell me something about it? It's, it's just insane. So it's called the NAPL. And I think it's unique. I don't, I don't think anybody else in, in college has access to a facility like that. And, you know, we have a sports scientist that just travels with us. And we are the only college basketball program that has one. And what we do with them is we study. I mean, he does. He's the, he's the smart one. Uh, is the, the uh, director of the NAPL is Chris Bach, and he's incredible. He, he basically, what we decided to do with him is this. Last year, we decided to start tracking performances in practice. So all our players, they are waiting a monitor every time they step on the court. And now we're using Catapult. So for a practice, for just a workout, even if they just need to do conditioning, they're waiting this uh, heart monitor that is going to track everything that goes on in their body during the workouts. And after every single practice, it's going to give us a report basically telling us what type of effort that specific player gave us is level of fatigue and not just for the day, but the accumulated level of fatigue for the week, the month, for the team, for the specific player, how a player is recovering from an injury. And that's a lot of information. But the good thing is that he's able to filter that to give us what we actually need because sometimes it can get messy. You can get where you have so much information, so much data, and you actually don't use it. So we decided to focus right now mainly on that. And he provides us with all this information. So, for example, if we're going for four or five days in a row, and he's the first one going to Coach Hoiberg and telling us, like, hey, player A, player B, they need to stop right now because otherwise they're going to get hurt real quick or real soon. And that's extremely helpful, especially when you're doing, like, you know, prep for the season during the summer to tell you exactly if the practices that we're doing are an exact simulation of a game effort. And we can use the numbers to prove that. And we can show the players. Like sometimes you have players that want to come in too much. You have, you know, both sides of the spectrum. You have kids that don't like to come in at all or kids that live in the gym. And sometimes you need to stop the kids that are coming in the gym too much. And like, dude, we just practiced three hours this morning. If you still have energy to go for two hours at night, it means that you're not going hard enough in practice. But you can actually show the numbers, and that always helps. And one thing that I want to mention, too, is we have the NAPL, like I said, and it helps us because at the beginning of every season, we run our own combine. So basically, we put our players – through the same combine that NBA players go through before the draft. And we show them a comparison between, okay, these are your numbers right here, and these are the average number from an NBA combine. This is how far you are from a pro, okay? Because those numbers are public, so everybody has access to that. And you can show them running the same tests with the same equipment you can see, okay, this is what DeAndre Ayton did. This is what Marvin Bagley did. This is what the Aaron Fox did. And this is where you are right now when you come in 
as a freshman or as a transfer at Nebraska. And then at the end of the year, we do that again to show them, okay, you jumped from point A to point B, and this is how much you still have to go to get what you want to get. And it's incredibly helpful to have numbers and data to prove that to the kids. Yeah, it's, it's crucial. You get the buy-in of the players right off the bat, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's very important. Okay, you just mentioned this data. Uh, so when it comes to recruitment, do you, what are the main physical characteristics that you try to, to find in your new players? Well, it, it depends. The way, the way Coach Hoiberg likes to play, it's based on two fundamentals, space and space, okay? So we're always looking for great athletes. And at the same time, we're looking for players that are able and allow us to space the court as much as we can. So I know that it's easier said than done, but we're looking always for good athletes that can shoot threes, you know? And we, we don't believe too much in, you know, we call it positionless basketball, where basically you have five guys on the court, we play five out and off on offense. So everybody needs to be able to play in all five spots. Of course, you're going to prefer to have a guy that is 6'8", 6'9", 6'10", but our starting five is 6'8". He's a kid from France that is 19 years old and he's an incredible athlete. Our backup center is a kid from England that is 6'11", but he has a 7'3 wingspan and he can run up and down the court. We, we need that to be able to play at the pace we want to play. And those are the main two um, skills that we're looking in a player. And then, you know, character-wise, we, we like to take challenges. We like to take kids that maybe didn't make it somewhere else because they were not like you or they didn't have the right chemistry with a staff in another school. And we're going to look for kids that are looking for a check, second chance. We, we have a lot of transfers on our roster. Uh, we have a lot of Juco kids on our roster that went to junior college, and we believe in those type of kids that are looking for a second opportunity. It seems to be a very fun system to watch. Yes, it is. I mean, last year wasn't so much because we were not able to convert as much, but the style of, we were able to implement the style of play uh, that we want to play. So we just talked about uh, players' recruitment. Uh, I want to know something about staff members recruitment. Well, you know, he, Coach Hoiberg has a very um, MBA-oriented mentality. So he always, in his career, always had older people on his staff because he's, he's really young. I mean, he's, he stopped playing basketball when he was young because he had a heart problem. And he went, to in, he went into the front office right away with the T-Walls. And so he's always trying to surround himself with people who are older than him and, you know, bring experience to the table. So that's why he, we have two people on staff that are, that are older than him because, you know, they bring something to the table that he knows he needs and that's experience at this level. And, and then after that, you know, it's, it's just people that can connect with the players because in college, There are a lot of things that are important, but your relationship with the players is going to be what matters the most. Because there's going to be times where it's going to be tough to communicate with a kid when he's 19, 20 years old. And the, the kids are going to have a lot of pressure when they're playing in front of 20,000 people. And if you don't have that relationship with them, it's going to be hard for you to tell them some things in the heat of the moment. And if there is no relationship, you're not going to be able to, co to you know, communicate with them. There is going to be a wall. And that's where it's very important that you have a strong staff that is able to build a relationship with the player. That, that's number one. I mean, it's definitely number one. And the, going back to seven years ago when you first got to the U.S., was it hard for you to build a relationship with, uh, with the players and with other staff members? Well, you know, it, it took me a little bit uh, just because, you know, I, I was a, a guy coming from overseas from the other side of the world with a crazy English accent. I mean, my English wasn't really good when I came into the United States. I mean, I was able to speak English, but for me to understand the different accents, especially at the beginning, was extremely complicated because, you know, we, we, all, we all grew up watching TV shows, but that, that's different. I mean, you have guys from 
the south with an accent. You have guys from the from from the west coast, from the east coast, from from the upper east. I mean, it's it's different. It, everybody has a different accent. At the beginning, you struggle a little bit with that. Even the players. I mean, you you see that firsthand. You have a kid that is from New York as an accent. A kid that is from Alabama as a different accent, and it's it's hard. It's not easy. So for me, it was a little bit of a struggle at the beginning, because building that level of trust with the kid comes with communication and you need to be able to communicate at a level where there is a constant communication and it wasn't easy in the beginning i was lucky and i was able to spend a lot of time with the italian kids at st john's because we have amar that played for us for four years so you know having someone that speaks italian on your team is great we have Federico Mussini as well that spent two years with us at St. John's and that made it easier. And we also had a decent number of European kids. So we had a kid from Germany, a kid from, from France, a kid from Spain. So that, that makes it easier. But now it's, it's way easier than it was seven years ago. But he always, you know, he always the outsider on the staff because you're the guy from Italy. And it's, it's, it actually helps you more now than when I started for sure. I mean, being from Italy? Well, yeah, they're always very curious, the kids. They come over and they, first of all, now they think, some, they think I'm from Brooklyn because I have this, you know, <laughs> a, a mafia accent, like they like to call it. And I have to explain, no, I'm not from Brooklyn. Not really. I'm actually, I, I'm from Rome. I'm a real Italian, not a, an American Italian. So they're always very curious. They come, they always have some parent or some family members that's originally from Italy so they always like to talk about it it's always fun yeah I guess it is so you just mentioned communication that is very very important so uh networking actually is another main topic that I want to talk about with you yeah uh you know what networking is way easier when you're in New York than in Nebraska because you're going to have way more people hitting you up. They're coming by New York. Can I get tickets for that game? Can I do this with you? Can I come by? There are not as many people that want to come and visit in Nebraska. But in our business, and you know this better than me, it's all about networking and being able to keep those relationships alive as much as you can. Because you never know who's going to make it where and who's going to be able to offer you a job or who's going to be working with you in a year or in two years. I mean, it's, it's a crazy story. I, when I started working at St. John's my second year, I was living with uh, two people on staff. One was a graduate assistant with me and another one was a very young assistant coach. And last night they won an NBA championship with the NBA, with the Lakers. They're on staff with the Lakers. And last year we were leaving together. And now they faced me last night with LeBron and uh, the, the NBA trophy, and you never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a crazy business one way or another. You can jump from very low to very high in two days, but it's the other way around too. You might be at the top of the world one day and all of a sudden you're very low. It's, it's, it's a tough business. Everybody wants to work in sport and wants to be part of, oh, it's so cool to be part of a team or work in basketball or football or soccer. It's very hard. It's very hard because they always ask you, oh, I mean, you have a great job. I mean, it's your passion. Yeah, I know, but it's not easy because you need to manage so many things and your emotions are always involved and in networking. You're always going to have to keep that alive because you cannot make a lot of enemies because you never know who's going to be the next coach here or the next general manager there. And it's, it's incredible. Sometimes I meet people now that I met 10 years ago when I was a Stella and maybe they are an assistant GM right now or something like that. And you never know. So that's, that's incredibly important in this business. And uh, how do you make sure to keep it alive? You know, the American way is a little bit different from the European way. I mean, I learned that working here, some, sometimes American people, and it's not in a disrespectful way, but you know, they, they, they hit you up like, hey, what's up, how you doing? And that's it. That is not common ground for a conversation. They just wanna make sure you know, hey, I, I, I still remember you, you remember me, just let's stay in touch. That doesn't mean a lot, but it just, you know, to keep that relationship alive. I, I, I try to do my best, 
with people that I know that I was able to create a relationship with to keep that relationship strong. But otherwise, I don't really believe in eating people up just for the just to eat them up if I don't have anything to say. Yeah, maybe once in a while, absolutely. But if I don't have something to tell that it's actually important, I, I just struggle a little bit with that. And that's something that I need to get better, that's for sure. Okay, we have almost arrived at the end of the, this episode. There are a few more questions that I want to make you. Uh, what's the biggest challenge that you have faced uh, during these seven years? You know what? I started thinking about a two years process. I came into the United States. I was a graduate assistant. I said to myself, I'm going to be here for two years. I'm going to get a master in sport management. I'm going to do this experience in college. But I didn't know anything about college basketball. I wanted to be a scout for the NBA and leave over, leave in Europe and just go around the world and, and see, and see basketball players. And then all of a sudden it happened. And, I always think that you need to be lucky in this business. Otherwise, you can try as much as you can, as much as you want. But if you're not lucky, you're not going to make it. I mean, it's the reality. And a struggle that I have, of course, it's a little bit is being away from home. I mean, it's, it's not easy. People will underestimate how hard it is, especially during a time like this where there is a pandemic going on in the world. And even if I want to, right now, I can't go home. And you're, you're far away from your family. You're far away from your, from your friends and, you know, you're missing home. That's probably the biggest struggle that, that I have right now. And probably it's a little bit more now because how far I am from home. I mean, I'm lucky that my wife is here that she moved into the United States three years now, three years ago. And, and now we live in, in Lincoln, Nebraska together. But otherwise, I mean, I haven't seen my family in almost a year. My friends, same thing. And you always think in the back of your mind, oh, I want to go back. But right now, there is not really a possibility to go back, unfortunately, because our situation in Italy is pretty rough. And really? probably you agree with me. I mean, if you can yeah. work in Italy, you probably prefer to work in Italy. But, yeah. I mean, I, it's I, <laughs> I feel you, Luca. I really feel you now. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. All right, Luca. So most of our listeners are young strength coaches and young coaches that are trying to break into professional work. Uh, is there a nugget that you want to leave them with? You know what? You, you need to, especially now that it's going to be, things are going to go back to normal at some point. I don't know if it's going to take a year, if it's going to take two years. Uh, and right now it's tough for everybody because a lot of people are losing their jobs or there is a lot of uncertainty of what's going to happen. You need to try to be brave and believe in your ideas, take a chance on yourself. And even if you have to spend two or three months away from home where you're learning from somebody and you're going, you have a chance to go somewhere and learn from somebody, I think this is, This is the best time to do that. And I know, of course, there is COVID and it's going to be tough. But as soon as things go back to normal, I, 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 have a chance, I had a chance to meet a lot of people that came over to New York and they spent a month, two months with us. A lot of Italian people, they reached out to me. And Coach Mullen was great with that. And we opened our doors to everybody. If we had somebody from overseas or somebody from the United States that wanted to come and see and learn with their own eyes how it, how it works, that's the most important thing that you can do. And you can learn a lot and you can, you can meet people and you never know, like you go and you travel to the United States, you spend a couple of months in college A, a couple of months in college B, and you build the relationship and you learn a lot from how people do things here in the United States. That's my suggestion. It's, you, you need to take a chance on yourself. You need to invest money in yourself, on yourself, as much as you can right now. Yeah, it's going to suck. You're not going to get paid to spend two months in the middle of nowhere and go and watch practice for two months. But if you want to make it, you want to work at the highest level, I mean, I don't see another way around it to do it. Because, yeah, I believe that in one year, two years, things are going to go back to normal, hopefully way before that. And I believe that immediately, like in other countries in Europe, there is going to be people that are willing to invest money in sports again at some point. I mean, it's, it's a cycle. Sooner or later, hopefully, 
it's going to happen. Like it, it, it's happening in Germany right now. It's happening in France. They're way, they're investing way more money in those two countries in basketball than there are in Italy. Yeah. Maybe you have four or five teams in Italy that are investing money, but everybody else, I mean, not so much. And you, you witnessed that firsthand. There are probably teams in second division in Italy that are spending more money than the bottom four or five teams in first division. That's probably the reality. And I hope that at some point, everybody's going to be able to invest more. And then you're going to have to be ready for that opportunity. But you need to study and be prepared. Because one thing that I learned is that you're going to have one chance and one only. And if you don't catch that chance, then... And I don't know how many, have, how many others you're going to have. So just be ready, be prepared, and invest on yourself as much as you can. Yeah, that's a very valuable message, uh, Luca. All right. So usually we finish off with uh, three rapid-fire questions. Okay? So yeah, I'm ready. The first one, your favorite city in the U.S.? Hmm. Oh, boy. Uh Uh, I mean, New York. I agree, 100%. <laughs> All right, second one. Pizza or mac and cheese? Well, it depends where you are in the United no, States. No, really? <laughs> if, you, if you move away from the East Coast, eating pizza is it's really hard. I mean, you get used to it. Now, I got used to eat pizza in Nebraska. But if you're on the East Coast... You go with pizza. If you move closer to the Midwest, then you go with mac and cheese. Actually, if you're Italian, also eating mac and cheese is tough. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. better than eating <laughs> Domino, probably. <laughs> All right. Your next goal, Luca. My next goal, I honestly, I don't know. It's, I love college basketball. I mean, I, I really do. I never thought I would like it this much. And I like the, the relationship that you build with the players. I love the college environment. I mean, working in the Big Ten is sensational. We go on the road and we play. I mean, it's, I, when I was in uh, St. John's, I was sitting on the bench at Madison Square Garden. I mean, it's something that I never expected before. I was sitting on the first row at Madison Square Garden. I did that for five years. Incredible. I did that at Staples Center. In Los Angeles. I mean, I was sitting where Phil Jackson was sitting. I mean, come on. Seriously? Um, it's, it's unbelievable. So that's why I love college basketball so much. The NBA, sure, everybody dreams about the NBA. If I'm going to have a chance to work in the NBA, I'm going to be more than happy. I think long term one day I want to go back and work at a high level somewhere in Europe because I think there is so much potential and it's a different business. But... I, I have goosebumps when I hear the EuroLeague song. I mean, it's something that I was born with, and it's always going to be in the back of my mind that, of course, college basketball is great. NBA finals, phenomenal. I mean, it's your luck if you get there. But for me, it's always been about, I mean, EuroLeague, devotion. That's, that was me when I was five years old going and watch Body Roga playing EuroLeague. That's what I always wanted to be. And I don't know where, if I'm going to have the chance to be there, but maybe that's, that's the ultimate goal. That's why I started working here. It's, I want to work in sports, in sports and in basketball because one day I want to be in EuroLeague. I don't know, it sounds a little bit crazy, but uh, who knows? I don't know if you have listened to it, but they have a new song, which is pretty cool. Actually. Yeah, I, yeah, actually I did a week ago, and that's why I got goosebumps listening to it. <laughs> Boy, I remember this song. It's crazy. <laughs> Okay, Luca, if someone wants to follow you, where can they find you? Oh, well, look, I have my Facebook account, my Instagram account, and my Twitter account. Everything goes by my name, Luca Virgilio. So anybody who is listening that wants to ask questions about college basketball or any curiosity about how I made it to Lincoln, Nebraska, shoot me an email, shoot me a text, shoot me an inbox, whatever you guys want. I'm always available to help. It was a great episode and uh, thanks again for hanging out with us, Luca. It was great. Thank you so much for having me.